everybody, I'm Joe Jackson. Welcome to another edition of the Military Aircraft Video Report. Well, strap yourself in. This issue takes you from the fast-paced world of the Air Force Thunderbirds to the cockpit of an old B-47. All that and a lot more. Here's a preview. First, we recommend that you get a seatbelt for your chair as we go flying with the Air Force Thunderbirds. The ambassadors in blue are taking their colorful F-16s to new heights of performance. And you'll be there in the cockpit for some of the most thrilling images ever filmed. You know, people ask me, uh, what's, what's it like to be a Thunderbird? It's probably everything that you could imagine it to be and then a whole lot more. It's, it's exciting, very demanding on your time. It's challenging, but it's very rewarding. And uh, I smile an awful lot. Then it's back in time to revisit the world of the B-47 Stratojet. This classic airplane blazed a trail that was later filled by the great B-52. But the B-47 was a champion in its own right, as we'll learn in this nostalgic look at the glory days of the Strategic Air Command. From there, it's an inside look at the F-15 Eagle at its best. We take our cameras to the home of the 318th Fighter Interceptor Squadron, one of the best air-to-air -air units in the Air Force. You'll be there for the rigors of aerial combat, and see what it's really like with the help of actual gun camera videotape. Finally, we meet the newest trainer in the U.S. Navy. This is the Gauze Hawk. But don't let the word trainer fool you. The Hawk has British roots in the form of one of the hottest airplanes in the world. Now, those are some stories I think you'll enjoy. But first, let's take our usual look into the world of new developments in military aviation. We'll start with a milestone for the Rockwell B-1B. With the introduction of the B-1B bomber in the Strategic Air Command inventory, the air-breathing leg of the Strategic Triad has received a much-needed shot in the arm. The B-1B is now operational at Dias Air Force Base in Texas, Ellsworth Air Force Base, South Dakota, Grand Forks Air Force Base, North Dakota, and McConnell Air Force Base, Kansas. Several recent events have focused attention on the B-1B as a maturing weapon system. In June of 1987, it stole the show at the Paris Air Show, attracting record crowds. And the flight demo it displayed when the bomber left was telling evidence of its agility and power. On July 4th, 1987, the bomber broke four existing world performance records two of which had been held by the Soviets. 14 additional records fell on this low-level speed run off the coast of California. Then again on September 17, 1987, more records fell in the payload, distance, and speed categories. All of this is serving to make the top man at the Strategic Air Command, General John T. Chain, very happy. The B-1 will also serve a critical part of our nation's conventional deterrent as well. Now we'll be able to respond globally and rapidly and deliver massive firepower to any location in the world and hold at risk anybody that thinks that they can screw around with the United States. The rollout of the B-1B aircraft number 100 from final assembly took place in January 1988. And the delivery of this, the final airplane, happened just a few months later in April. Now that the Air Force has had some experience with the bomber, here's what some of the men who have flown the B-1B have to say about it. Flying the airplane, the B-1, like that, down low at those speeds, it makes the B-1 impossible to shoot down. Virtually impossible. Just from brute force, pure speed and low altitude. I know of no aircraft or missile in the air that could defeat that and I know of no uh, ground threat that could defeat that. It'd be pure luck. The B-1 program is a major success story. Within 33 months 
after contract go-ahead. Over 5,200 subcontractors were put on contract. The production facility was built, and the first production article was rolled out. In anybody's terms, that's a major accomplishment. When the new B-2 stealth bomber joins the ranks, it will join the Rockwell B-1B to form the tip of the spear in America's air-breathing nuclear deterrence well into the next century. The Vietnam-era CH-47 Chinook is going to be showing up in a new version in the not-too-distant future. Boeing has won a contract from the Army to develop what is called the MH-47E, a high-tech version of the Chinook to be used in special operations. The new Chinook will be specially designed to operate at night and in bad weather at low level. Special operations calls for using the helicopter to engage a long-range penetrations of enemy territory to conduct clandestine missions. In order to do that, the Chinook will have terrain avoidance radar, new engines, a refueling probe, and increased armament. Look for the new Chinook to show up in 1991. Amid much pomp and ceremony, a joint project of Boeing and Bell is taking the stage. Say hello to the V-22 Osprey, the last word in vertical flight technology. The Osprey is a bridge between the airplane and the helicopter and makes use of the best of both worlds. It's a dream that all the armed forces have wanted to have fulfilled for a long time. That dream began in the 1930s when a heliplane was patented but never built. It was a design remarkably similar to later tilt rotor designs. At the end of World War II, many forward thinkers began developing converted plane designs and building prototypes. In fact, in 1950, the U.S. Air Force announced a competition to design a true working converted plane. The McDonnell Company built a special helicopter known as the XV-1, but Bell Aircraft decided on a different approach, called the XV-3. In 1955, during an attempt to actually fly the plane, the XV-3 experienced violent vibrations in the wing and rotors. After analyzing the problem, Bell modified the design and tested a new system. On December 17, 1958, the modified version completed the world's first in-flight tilt rotor conversion. Over the next few years, the concept was refined, and during the same period, Boeing developed the VZ-2. These two companies continued to pursue tilt rotor technology until the 60s and 70s, when Bell came out with the XV-15. The plane first flew in hover in 1977, and for nine years, the XV-15 proved the concept really did make sense. By the early 1980s, the stage was set for the entrance of the V-22, the Osprey must carry twice the payload of heavy lift helicopters, over twice the distance, all at a lower cost. Bell, Boeing, and Allison, with its turboshaft engine, teamed up to win a contract for the V-22, and soon work began on the first aircraft. Nearly all the Osprey's wings and fuselage structural elements are fashioned out of graphite epoxy composites. In fact, construction of the airplane includes nearly all of the best in new avionics, including fly-by-wire controls, head-up display, and advanced props. From the beginning, the dream of tilt-rotor flight has never died, and this, the V-22, represents the focal point of decades of effort. It's no wonder that nearly every service branch is interested in the Osprey. The venerable Lockheed C-130 has been around for many years. It is now joining the ranks of airplanes which are being flown by pilots who are younger than the airplanes they are flying. But there's a reason for the Herky Bird's popularity. In a word, its versatility. Perhaps the most powerful role being played by the airplane these days is as a gunship. The AC-130s were used in Vietnam with devastating effectiveness. 
And now Rockwell International is in the process of updating the gunship to the AC-130U standard. The current gunship force consists of 10 older AC-130s operated by the Air Force Reserve. There are another 10 assigned to the Air Force Special Operations Squadron in Florida. Right now, Rockwell is looking to put in a 25 millimeter Gatling gun that will be able to fire at 6,000 rounds per minute. Also a 40 millimeter cannon and a 105 millimeter howitzer, all with special racks to allow for quick and easy ammunition loading. Add to that a digital fire control radar, low light television, and a battle management station, and you have an attack plane with quite a punch. Although it hardly seems possible, the C-130 airframe is nowhere near outliving its usefulness. Count on seeing this familiar shape for many years to come. If it's true that actions speak louder than words, then few organizations send a message with more clarity than the Air Force Thunderbirds. Right now, we want to take you into the world of the ambassadors in blue. And even if you've seen them before, we think this point of view is unique. Air Force Thunderbirds. Over the years, millions of people have thrilled to sights like this, and countless others have seen it on television or in films. Today, the tradition continues in an unbroken line of excellence. Here now is the story of how they do what they do, year after year, show after show. It usually begins this way for most observers. The resplendent red, white, and blue F-16s arriving for another show. This scene has been repeated nearly 3,000 times since 1953. The ambassadors in blue, as they're called, arrive with as much panache as you would expect. Only it impresses you more than you thought it would. Everything is so precise. There are a lot of things that go into making the difficult look routine. And in the next few minutes, you'll learn about most of it. But let's start with what most people focus on, the pilots. They are the personification of professionalism. Only 11 officers are assigned to the team. And with more than 100,000 officers in the Air Force, well, you get the idea. It's tough to get in. 
Even the team members will tell you there are a lot of deserving folks that never make the cut. Here's Lance Ungem, slot pilot. I'm the lucky one that was chosen to do it. I know a hundred other guys that could fly the show in my position and do the, do the job as well as I do. And it's just as tough for the maintenance crew to get assigned to the Thunderbirds. As soon as the airplane comes to a halt, they are literally swarmed upon by the cream of the crop in Air Force crew chiefs. As we'll see, there is literally no margin for error. And a highly motivated support staff is absolutely essential. People like Staff Sergeant Paul Duncan. We're the best we can be. We try to put 100% in everything we do. Consider the fact that in the entire history of the Thunderbirds, a performance has never been canceled due to mechanical failure. That kind of record requires painstaking effort. And there is more than just the mechanical soundness of the airplane. They have to look good as well as work properly. And that means hours of cleaning and cleaning and more cleaning. Even when you're just cleaning, you're always looking at it. Like the two people that work on that same airplane all the time, we're, uh, we're constantly looking at it. You get to know that airplane better than you know uh, the back of your hand. Paul's crew chief, Staff Sergeant Steve Thompson, puts this perspective on it. Look at it this way. That there is a reflection of my personality, Paul's personality, who happens to be my assistant crew chief. It's just a reflection of us. And if that looks good, we look good. The instrument employed by the Thunderbirds is the F-16 Fighting Falcon. Without a doubt, one of the most popular fighters in the world, it is frontline equipment for perhaps a dozen nations. Its Pratt & Whitney F-100 engine and advanced computerized flight controls give it the ability to turn up to nine Gs instantly. The F-16 is also the first airplane the Thunderbirds have had in a long time that can instantly be made ready for combat, which the unit would do if called upon. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take two pros each on a count of three. And one, two, three, and one more, please. A big part of what the Thunderbirds do on a more routine basis is to help recruit for the Air Force. And this scene is not at all unusual. Here, new recruits are being sworn in at a ceremony with the Thunderbirds. It's a thrill of a lifetime for the recruits and supplies long-range goals for those with the vision to dream of someday being on the team. Electronics training guaranteed and computer repair. I'd like to be a pilot myself, but, uh, you know, chances aren't very good, but, you know, I'm going to try for it. Maybe even a Thunderbird. Maybe. <laughs> the work of the Thunderbirds begins at their home base at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada. Here, they hone the skills needed to put on an impressive and safe performance during the show season. And it is here that they come as close as possible to the elusive goal of the perfect air show. When we go on the road to, to put our shows on, we're at a level where the average air show spectator is not going to notice that there's anything wrong with a maneuver or with a show. Uh, that's the level, that's our basic entry level uh, air show. But there are a lot of things wrong with the show, and it's very difficult to go out and fly an air... It's impossible to fly an air show perfectly. You just can't do everything right. And so we just continue to strive to make no mistakes during an air show. Uh, you can't do that. You can get close, and there, therein lies the challenge. Diving ready now. Gradually, the airplanes come closer together as the practice session takes them nearer to the actual show routine. When they are just inches apart, it seems dangerously close to the average person, but not to the pilots, because this is what they have been trained to do. The practice doesn't make perfect, but it makes you awfully doggone good. Given that the aircraft are operating, we can go out and fly day in and day out and enjoy it while we do it, put on a good air show. That it is supposed to look exciting. We want it to look exciting, but it's in, really in no way dangerous because we're, we're trained. Uh, we spend not, four months doing nothing but flying twice a day every day, getting ready to go on the road for the show season. And now the practice is over. It's time to start the show.
precision that will be seen in the air begins on the ground. The ground crew first. Each step is measured and practiced, with each man trying to look a little more sharp than the other. And then come the pilot. like some precise dance choreographed to perfection and seemingly effortless in its execution. For the first time Thunderbird pilot, this moment can be one of high anxiety, despite all the practice. I remember when I flew my first uh, couple of air shows, and it was, uh, you're, let's face it, you're, it's like you're on stage, you're a performer. And I get the butterflies and, and all that, you know, we had, my first show was in Phoenix and we had 300,000 people there, and I was lucky to get the airplane started, let alone go fly an air show in it. But that wears off after five air shows or so. Now. I've flown 100, 120 air shows, and the butterflies aren't there, and you get, get back to the basics of trying to fly the airplane to put on as, as good a show as you can. At this point, each move of the performance is already etched in each pilot's mind, like a template. Each location demands a slightly different way of approaching it, but the essentials are the same. And the planning is made easier by the number of times these pilots go over and over the same routine. And the show that we put on, you know, we just don't come out here and wing a show. Uh, the air show that we fly, we have practiced a thousand times. And so we come in and we, we know exactly what we're going to do. We know exactly what's going to happen during the air show. And once again, that adds to our safety uh, aspect of, of the mission. Thunderbird, two, three, four, five, eight. Let's run them up. diamond is airborne, the solo pilots do their thing, and there's no turning back now. This high performance beauty and grace has not been specially created just to thrill the crowd. The team is demonstrating maneuvers which have been proven successful in actual combat situations. Variations on the same aerial tactics are taught to every Air Force pilot. It is the discipline, timing, and practice that help to bring maneuvers to low level and transform otherwise ordinary flight into this.
F-16 is one of the best show airplanes the Thunderbirds have ever flown. And not just because it looks good. It just so happens that it's also a very good formation aircraft. And uh, once you learn a few tricks of the trade, so to speak, you can keep that aircraft in a position on a smooth day within, say, six inches of where you really want the airplane to be, and that's pretty good. maneuver builds in intensity, as the planes seem to be linked by some invisible thread. In reality, each pilot is lost in total and complete concentration on the task at hand. Yet, ironically, this is what the pilots consider the relaxing thing to do. When I want to get away, get away from the, vigor, the rigors of the office, then I, if I get a chance to go get in my jet and go do it, then, uh, then that's what I want to do. So, it's very enjoyable in that regard. At last, it's time to break for landing. And reluctantly, they bring the F-16s back to Earth. Being back on the ground signals the end of another show and the beginning of the process that will start anew almost immediately. For the pilots, there is always a feeling of high exhilaration and disappointment that it's over for now. A lot of us are in fighter aviation for the love of aviation. And a lot of the other things go along with it. Certainly we, get, we have the opportunity to serve our country and in, in, in this capacity as a Thunderbird and we not only represent the Air Force but also the country and I'm very proud of that but uh, I think the real heart of, uh, of the matter is that we do it for the love of aviation and you see an awful lot of uh, sad fighter pilots when they're, uh, when they're asked to sit behind a desk for long periods of time and, and uh, push pencils instead of fly jets. But that day is inevitable. Thunderbird flying officers serve a two-year tour with one half of the pilots changing each year to ensure a smooth transition. Almost before they know it, it's time to leave the ambassadors in blue. And, uh, I'll look back with it uh, on the, the experience and uh, I wish it wouldn't come to an end so soon. I'm gonna miss it very much. But what a legacy has been left behind. Over the years, the Thunderbirds have won the McKay Trophy for the most meritorious flight in the Air Force and seven other outstanding unit awards. And so, another flight demonstration goes into the logbook, and preparations are already underway for the next show, and the next. Maintenance people will again inspect every nut and bolt. Pilots will debrief and supply people will try to stay one step ahead of the game. But it all works. And given what we've just seen, it seems certain the Thunderbirds are assured of many more years of dazzling performances.
the entire history of the Thunderbirds. A performance has never been canceled due to mechanical failure. Now that's quite a record. And from the looks of things, that tradition of excellence is going to continue. Now, in our next story, we meet one of the most impressive small jets ever built. Usually, when we think of a trainer, we don't think of a hot, sophisticated airplane. That is, until you meet a family of airplanes called the Hawks. It's the dawn of a new era in naval aviation, signaled by the sight of a brand new airplane rolling out under its own power. Meet the McDonnell Douglas T-45 Gauzehawk. This is the way Navy pilots will be trained from now on. But the Gauzehawk finds its roots in a British aerospace design. And in order to fully understand just how remarkable this airplane is, you really have to start with the British. was conceived from the outset to be an efficient and reliable multi-role trainer with significant operational potential as well. It was begun as a private venture in the early 70s as a trainer for the Royal Air Force and is now generally regarded as the most successful two-seat trainer attack plane of its era. Since it was introduced in RAF service in 1976, the Hawk has set a standard for jet training airplanes the world over. It is praised by students, instructors, and engineers alike. One of the major factors affecting student training in the early stages is confidence. Everything about the Hawk helps to instill confidence right from the start. The cockpit provides a comfortable working and learning environment with an uncluttered instrument layout and simple operating procedures. All of this helps the student to pass quickly to the main goal that is, getting the hawk into the air. Most of the initial concerns about flying the airplane soon fade as the student makes the transition to a fast jet environment. Confidence builds with the hawk's easy handling which means the instructor can get by with minimum interference. Perhaps the best thing about the Hawk is its ability to safely demonstrate all kinds of maneuvers, predictably. Maneuvers which could have dire consequences in a less controllable airplane. Increasingly, the student's ability to think and react under pressure is tested, and the Hawk can handle all phases of the transition. Until at last, the student is ready to apply himself to the real job, learning to use the Hawk as a fighter. In order to put weapons on target accurately, a high level of expertise is demanded. Because the airplane handles so well, 
It frees the student to concentrate on the sight handling techniques needed to deliver weapons on time and on target. As you can see, the instructor has a great view from the back seat from which to provide guidance. From this point, the student can branch out to learn more about the defensive and offensive maneuvers, navigation at low level, and more. Practically alone among frontline trainers, the Hawk has the ability to go operational and pack a healthy wallop. That means it can do the job that might require additional, more expensive airplanes. The savings resulting from this type of aircraft usage also help set the Hawk apart. And when it's all said and done, the student may find himself piloting the Hot Tornado or some other frontline British jet. The Hawk can also be a frontline airplane, especially with the help of forward-looking infrared radar and night vision goggles for the pilot. Add to that a laser rangefinder for weapons delivery radar warning, and flare and chaff dispensers for self-defense, and you have a frontline airplane, not just a trainer. As a final measure of the inherent quality of the design, witness the Hawk 200, a single-seat version. Even though McDonnell Douglas is the prime contractor on the T-45, British Aerospace is responsible for a good deal of the construction, including the wing center section, tail, windscreen and canopy. Rolls-Royce is supplying the Adour engine. Along with the completed airframes, McDonnell Douglas will provide a complete training system to go with the T-45. It includes computer-aided instructional devices, terminals, and academic materials as well. Here's Vice Admiral John Fetterman, commander of the Naval Air Forces for the Pacific Fleet. The T-45 aircraft represents the cornerstone of a total integrated training system concept. The T-45 training system will provide the Navy with the capability to produce up to 600 carrier-capable pilots per year through the year 2015. And that's a feeling which is echoed by Jim Warsham, the president of Douglas Aircraft Company. And the entire world of training has focused their eyes upon us and the Navy for what we're doing. It's a unique program, a program unique for both government and industry. Now that the U.S. Navy has picked up the gauntlet, that ensures the Hawk's survival into the next century. Current plans call for the Navy to acquire 300 of the T-45s. And while this plane may look a lot like the RAF Hawk, there are some mighty important differences. The T-45 has a tail hook, a new main and nose landing gear, and strengthened airframe to allow it to take the stress of carrier landings, especially with students at the controls. Final assembly of the T-45 takes place here at the Douglas Aircraft Plant in Long Beach, California. And it was here that the plane took its first flight shortly after the rollout. testing of the T-45s will take place in Yuma, Arizona, and you can look for the first student to climb into a Gauzhawk in the first quarter of 1990 at Kingville, Texas. When the Gauzhawk system is fully up to speed, the Navy can expect to train pilots with 42% less aircraft than today. It looks like a pretty good deal for all concerned. Bottom line is, today's students are tomorrow's fighter pilots, and the Hawk is going to be the starting point for a sizable number of the free world's pilots. A Hawk on final approach will continue to be a common sight 
for years to come. to all of the other advantages, the Goshawk will save over 48 million gallons of fuel every year. Sounds like a winner on all counts. Now for our historical piece, we revisit the world of this old bird, the B-47 Stratajet. I was in the Air Force when these came online, and I remember how much we thought of the airplane. Join us as we turn back the pages of time. It was the queen of the skies. And although it never fired a shot in anger, the B-47 Stratojet occupies a place as one of the pivotal jet bombers in aviation history. Here is the story of the jet and the men who flew it. That story began for many men on the plains of Kansas. Here near Wichita is McConnell Air Force Base, known as one of the toughest schools in the Air Training Command. The men who came here learned to fly one of the hottest airplanes of its time, the Boeing B-47. Gentlemen, on behalf of the 3520th Combat Crew Training Wing, we welcome you to McConnell Air Force Base. Now you're here for an intensive training period qualify you as crew members in the B-47 airplane. Now to acquaint you with some of the history of the Stratajet, we take you back to 1943, to the dark days of World War II. At that time, the B-17 was the mainstay of the Army Air Corps. The super fortress, the B-29, was just starting in production. At the request of the Air Force, the Boeing Company began studies on the next generation of big bombers. This would be a bomber with something new at the time, the jet engine. These studies, thousands of research hours and exhaustive wind tunnel tests, led to a six-jet swept-wing airplane. On December 17, 1947, exactly 44 years from the day the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk, the XB-47 took to the skies. That flight sparked a revolution. Jet-powered airplanes were definitely here to stay. By early 1948, the Air Force had decided it wanted stratojets, lots of them. That decision led to reopening of the government B-29 plant in Wichita, Kansas. Two years later, in March of 1950, the dream came to life as the standard production models began to roll off the line. Within four years, 100 B-47s had been built. The first production model was not the end. A continuous program of development kept the Stratojet in front. From the current model was developed the RB-47, a reconnaissance model. The radical new design was powered by six 6,000-pound 6, thrust J-46 GE-25 engines, which are grossly underpowered by today's standards. But still, it gave the Stratojet a maximum performance of 606 miles per hour at 16,000 feet. Still, the B-47 often needed help getting airborne under conditions of extreme weight. And that's where Jato bottle thrust provided an additional 33,000 pounds of thrust. So, gentlemen, that's the airplane. Now, you'll learn that she flies by teamwork. A combat crew of three, aircraft commander, pilot, and observer. 
So you pilots may just as well regard the observer as the blue chip passenger. When you're coming in over the target, it's his baby. When your observer calls for a sudden station, all this vast program, all this effort, is no better than the observer's skill in those few seconds over the target. Now your instructors here at McConnell are prepared to qualify you as B-47 combat crew teams. Now, it's up to you. And for that day and age, it was a tall order. The training to fly a B-47 was as complex as any in the history of the Air Force. A seemingly endless mass of systems and procedures were involved. And with only a crew of three, teamwork was vital. It was needed to understand the 27 miles of electrical wiring, the thousand electronics tubes, hydraulics, compressors, valves, and gauges without end. The observer was probably the most important crew member in terms of putting bombs on the target. He had to learn about radar, and the key, this small handle, which actually controlled the bomber while it was on its final bomb run. Then the electronics took over, helping to compute all the variables for an accurate bomb run, primitive by today's standards of laser and optical guided bombs. But for the time, it was the best thing going. After weeks of intensive effort, it was time for the crew to solo the airplane. than not, the outcome was predictably routine. After all, the Air Force usually sent its best to train in what was the hottest bomber in the world. McConnell turned them out en masse for assignments all over the world. B-47s were deployed from Europe to the Far East and Africa. To achieve and maintain a high degree of readiness, then as now, simulated missions were flown under rigorous conditions. And our now operational crew is quickly thrown into the fray. Control Tower, this is Air Force 1956. Ready for takeoff, over. Air Force 1956. Cleared for takeoff. Roger, coming up on power. Although it was heavier than any World War II bomber, including the B-29, the B-47 was classified as a medium bomber. In the sky, it was as sleek and capable as anything in the air. Gear up. Gear coming up. The B-47 could climb at 4,600 feet per minute and had a range of over 4,000 miles. But like any jet, it was very thirsty and refueling was a common practice. Tom. Our scheduled refueling time is 2400. Uh, it's about six minutes to go. Where's that tanker airplane? Uh, hold your present heading. I have the tanker on radar. You should have him in sight now. Roger. I have the tanker in sight. Nice going, Tom. We're going in right on the button. Sam, get set for refueling contact. Roger, Cliff. Refueling checklist complete. Slipway door open. Get your credit card ready. She's all yours. Okay, Sam. Watch our fuel distribution. I'm ready to contact. At the time, for security reasons, aerial refueling contacts and the Strategic Air Command were handled in radio silence between tanker and bomber. 
This delicate maneuver became so routine in the Air Force that even at the time, a refueling was taking place every three and a half minutes, around the clock, somewhere in the world. Just about got our load. Okay, pressure disconnect. Refueled and ready to fly through the long night to the target, a sleeping city seven miles below. At dawn, exactly on schedule, bombs away. Steady on zero four five. We're on autopilot. Roger. I have the target on radar. Center the PDI and give me second station. The PDI is centered. You have second station. Roger. I have it. Time to go. 180 seconds. This was the payoff. Three men, a machine, and the skills of thousands of people funneled into a few critical seconds. You have 30 seconds before bomb release. seconds. Ten. Five, four, three, two, one. As it turned out, the B-47 never did drop bombs in anger. But many a contrail curved through the world's skies as a symbol of the readiness of the Strategic Air Command. And the men who flew the B-47 will always remember that it opened the door for jet bombers in the U.S. Air Force. That role will never be forgotten. B-47s left these days, but this one at the Museum of Flight in Seattle is one of the finer examples still in existence. Now, we shift gears back to the present. One of the best units in the Air Force is the 318th Fighter Interceptor Squadron, known as the Green Dragons. We recently visited them to find out why they were so well thought of. The answer became obvious rather quickly. In the distance stands one of the most impressive mountains in North America, Mount Rainier. And in the foreground, one of the most impressive Air Force squadrons in North America. This is the Great Northwest, McCord Air Force Base, home of the 318th Fighter Interceptor Squadron, the Green Dragons.
318th is one of the few remaining active duty air defense squadrons in the Air Force. Their world famous blue tailed flash is a recognized symbol of excellence in air to air tactics. realize this place is special. Here is Lieutenant Colonel Craig Bernhardt to explain why. Once they are here, they immediately get the attitude of a can-do attitude. We're going to do it. Uh, this is the cost, but we can do whatever we're tasked to do. And uh, with the facilities, we have some of the finest facilities. You have good facilities for people. You, you take care of them, and they perform. And that has been the winning solution in Tactical Air Command and in the 318th. The Green Dragons make use of the F-15 Eagle, arguably the best air-to-air -air fighter in the world today. It first flew in July of 1972 and immediately established itself. Its two Pratt & Whitney F-100 engines develop more than 50,000 pounds of thrust, and that gives the airplane a thrust-to-weight ratio of better than one to one. Translation, it can accelerate tremendously going straight up. Here's a look at the airplane taking off in full afterburner. This is obviously an impressive sight, but don't expect to see this all the time. Usually only planes on alert take off this way. Most of the time, military power will get the bird airborne just fine, thank you. Now the Eagle is large for a fighter, but that size is necessary to support the large radar, which can detect targets well over 50 miles away. Also, it has huge wings to make the plane highly maneuverable. But even though you're dealing with an airplane the size of a World War II medium bomber, make no mistake, this is a fighter plane. In fact, all those capabilities and the special environment here at the 318th are helping to continue a unit history that is steeped in achievement. And if you have a, a great past like this squadron, and the squadron started back in 1942 in Bedford, Massachusetts, and P-40s, went through World War II and has flown aircraft such as the P-51, the F-86, the F-106 Delta Dart, T-33, and uh, uh, now the F-15, and next June we'll be going to the F-16, it kind of builds on itself. Uh, squadron won the Use Trophy in 76, and then again in 80, uh, 84. Uh, which is for the best air-to-air -air squadron in the Air Force. We've been nominated two years since that uh, for the award, although we didn't win it. Uh, people just get it inside themselves and, and start believing in themselves that they're in the squadron and you're going to succeed. As Colonel Bernhard mentioned, the future will bring the F-16 Fighting Falcon to McCord. And the F-15s will be transferred to a National Guard unit. But the arrival of the new aircraft will not mean a change in the basic mission here. The specialty of the Green Dragons is air defense. That means attack warning and assessment. It means having airplanes standing by on five-minute alert, here and in California. And in the event of war, it also means defending the Northwest against attack. And there's more. Last summer, we intercepted a drug smuggler coming up the West Coast. We've gone off on Navy planes, hijacked planes, people who are lost. And basically, we're here to police the airspace around the United States. Because the mission here concentrates on air-to-air -air combat, this is one of the best places in the country for other units to come and hone their skills. Today, the Marines are occupying part of the tarmac. The Death Rattlers of VMFA-323 have brought their FA-18 Hornets to go against the Eagles of the 318. You see, in the air-to-air -air game, you learn by flying against airplanes other than your own. When you're flying two F-15s against two F-15s, sometimes you lose your partner out there, and you don't know if you're gunning your partner or you're gunning the opponent, so there's some hesitation. When you're flying against uh, other opponents that are dissimilar, there's no hesitation. You know who's good and you know who's bad. At least for the sake of today's exercise, the Hornets are the bad guys. And with the pre-flight paperwork just about finished, it's time to mount up and go flying.
This is what the pilots live for. And all throughout the pre-flight phase, the excitement builds, no matter how many times you've done it before. It is uh, a very natural high, and uh, you're, it's like an addict. You need to fly more and more because it, uh, it makes you feel great inside being able to command a ship like that uh, and to fly. Along with the Eagles, the Death Rattlers get their Hornets rolling as well. It's time for man against man, airplane against airplane, in the toughest form of military flying, air-to-air -air combat. This kind of performance just wouldn't be possible on a consistent basis without an excellent support staff. The Eagle is a marvelous but complicated bird, and the maintenance crews are the part of the picture that you don't often see. They are behind the scenes, making it all happen. People like Tech Sergeant Kathy Hardy. It's the 318th. I mean, we actually spend more time here than we do at home. We have to like it if it's not clean and if it's not the way you want it to look it's going to reflect on everything else that you do. And if it's a nice place to be, you're going to enjoy your work a little bit more. It takes approximately 45 hours of maintenance per flying hour to keep the F-15 flying, uh, which is an awful lot of, a lot of work. We have inspection docks, and every 100 hours in the F-15, you inspect it uh, to make sure it's in good shape. And the inspections range from one day to three weeks. But even with the long hours of maintenance, the Eagle is a much easier airplane to take care of than the older generation airplanes, a fact which is greatly appreciated by the staff. Here's Tech Sergeant Jim Baker. Things that you work on, the flight controls and the, the maintenance portion, the upkeep, it, it, they don't break as often as the F-4s did. And in the areas that you have to go into the work, there's, it's a lot easier accessible areas to where the F-4, you just about have to take half the airplane apart to get to it. I'd say we have some of the most dedicated people uh, in the Air Force are our maintainers who uh, work these long hours, keep these planes flying, and yet don't get paid, they say, the same amount that uh, the pilots do. So they are really the unsung heroes of the squadron. The Eagles must also be kept looking good on the outside, and that's where the paint shop comes in. As much detail and care are taken here as in every other part of the maintenance process. Right now, the Eagles are being repainted and the familiar blue flash on the tail will be replaced by the tail code TC. Since the 318th was one of the last units in the Air Force to be allowed a colorful unit emblem, there are admittedly mixed feelings about the change. But as Colonel Bernhard points out, We as F-15 pilots fly uh, very similar to the F-15 pilots all over the world. The standard uh, tail insignia are two letters for F-15s, and uh, we're, we're falling in line with the, the rest of TAC and the rest of the F-15 fleet uh, to have those letters. But even after the blue tails are gone, there is and will always be a special feeling here. As you've heard, this unit has won at least as many accolades as any other squadron in the Air Force. And this is where it really shows, in the air. The key to staying alive in this tough world is what the pilots call situational awareness. That means that even when there are multiple aircraft, multiple threats, and fighting in the vertical and horizontal planes, 
The pilot who comes out ahead is the one who knows at any given point where he is, where the enemy is, and what can be done to put ordnance on the target. totally encompassing. Uh, there is no time to think of anything else except the flying that you're doing. And specifically for us, flying becomes secondary, working the radar and the weapon system and uh, doing the basic maneuvering against other airplanes then becomes primary. So you don't have any time to think about what's happening. What it takes is a supersonic athlete. And if you don't believe it, listen to the physical exertion required in just a few seconds of aerial maneuvering between an eagle and a hornet. 3,000, fight on. Off the wing. Control there. Airspeed there. You did a sensory level turn there. For the men returning from this kind of exercise, there are really no winners or losers, just good pilots who are even better as a result of lessons learned. Flying in these high-performance aircraft and pulling G-forces, say if you pull seven Gs, your arm weighs seven times its normal weight, or your head weighs that, and it is very physically demanding. It's like isometric exercises. So you come back and you are mentally and physically exhausted uh, from a great workout, but you feel just absolutely fantastic. And so, another day draws to a close in the life of the Green Dragon. They have a complex and difficult mission that is being accomplished because the people here desire success more than anything else. I love it here. I've tried to do anything to stay here for the rest of my tour, which is another 10 years. I plan on staying around here. The pride of the 318th, it's there. It's genuine. As far as I'm concerned, this is one of the best units I've ever been in. Uh, there's more teamwork here than what I've seen in a lot of other places. And the teamwork here contributes to the overall mission that we do here. Whatever we are tasked, we have always done extremely well. We're ready to do our peacetime, wartime, or our training mission uh, right now. I think we're at uh, peak combat capability. Tomorrow, the Green Dragons of the 318th Fighter Interceptor Squadron will demonstrate that fact all over again, here in the shadow of Mount Rainier. Well, now you can see why other units come from far and wide to fly against the 318th. If you want to be the best, you got to learn from the best. Well, that's all for this edition of the Military Aircraft Video Report. We hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, tell a friend. We can always use another viewer. So we'll see you next time. So long, everybody.